Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Spurs Up Show, the Best Game Cox podcast on the internet. Today is Thursday, April the 15th, 2021. Today's show, I break down this weekend series as Game Cox baseball travels to Baton Rouge to take on the LSU Tigers. That series beginning tonight, first pitch at 7.30. Tomorrow, of course, at 8 o'clock, and then Saturday at 3. Guys, I'll break down the series in its entirety. Of course, we'll talk LSU, break down their pitching, their hitting. Also, of course, break down the Gamecocks, talk South Carolina's rotation, what to watch for, key player for the weekend. I'll give my prediction as well, as again, the Gamecocks go on the road to take on LSU. Also, guys, we've got news and notes to get into, your listener questions, and a fantastic interview. If you've tuned into Gamecocks baseball at any point this season on SEC Network Plus, you've heard his voice. Birch Antley joined me, Gamecocks play-by-play man for Carolina Baseball on the SEC Network Plus Network. Join me to talk about his time with South Carolina, his path in sports media. Really great conversation. Really awesome to get Birch's perspective. We also talked Gamecocks baseball this season, Mark Kinks and all that good stuff, guys. We got a packed show here on a Thursday. Sit back, relax, enjoy. It's all brought to you by our friends over at Upstate Movers Group. Guys, Upstate Movers Group, superior moving service. They bring care and attention on the companies can't offer because they're just too busy maintaining trucks and profiting off of them instead of focusing on service. Guys, service is what separates Upstate Movers Group from the competition. They're not a trucking company. They're a moving services company, and they're also employee-owned co-op. Their movers are paid twice the industry average, and everyone on the crew is invested in your success. They have dedicated professional crew members, and they also offer black glove service. They offer end-to-end packing services, custom crating and packaging for special items, and cleaning services as well. They're founded by Greenville Natives and University of South Carolina alumni guys, so a Gamecock-owned small business. They also offer 20 years of project management moving experience, and they can offer logistics and solutions that traditional moving companies simply do not have the skills for. Guys, whether in the upstate or across the state of South Carolina. If you have any moving needs in 2021, be sure to check out our friends over at Upstate Movers Group. You can find them on social media at Upstate Movers Group, or of course, if you have any other questions, go to their website, upstatemoversgroup.com. That's upstatemoversgroup.com. Be sure to check them out and tell them Chris from the Spurs Up Show sent you. Let's get it. Boys and girls, how are we doing here on a Thursday? Hope you're doing well. I'm Chris Phillips, host the Spurs Up show as always. Appreciate you guys tuning in, and I'm fired up. I'm fired up here on a Thursday. It is officially game day. Gamecocks baseball beginning a pivotal SEC road series in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, as South Carolina takes on the LSU Tigers. Again, folks, appreciate you all tuning in. Hoping you're all having a fantastic week, guys. Again, it's been crazy with this week with me getting back from Atlanta on Monday to having the Thursday through Saturday series instead of Friday through Sunday. I I remember waking up like yesterday. I was like, dude, what day of the week is it? I have no clue. But all I know is this. It is game day as Gamecocks baseball takes on LSU game one tonight at 730 on ESPNU in Baton Rouge, folks. Again, thank you so much for tuning in. I'm so pumped, so excited. A quick update, quick quick uh, business updates before we get rolling. It's something I've kind of hinted on on the Daily Crow and kind of told them about, but I want to put it out here on the podcast. Um, just want to say a huge shout out and thank you to you all that support the podcast, support the business overall, uh, but especially support the merch. You know, we've been dropping merch like crazy left and right on TSUS.store, by the way, shameless plug. If you need your Rowdy Roosters merch, if you need any baseball merch, football merch, whatever, we got all the merch on TSUS.store. We've been going crazy with the merch. And it's because of you guys' love and support that we, you know, that we come across, you know, unique opportunities and just opportunities in general. Of course, you guys probably remember a couple of months ago, rivals in Florence, South Carolina reached out to me, wanted to carry a bunch of our Beamer merchandise and, and some of the other stuff we had made. 
actually just struck a brand new deal with them. They are re-upping on a lot of the Beamer stuff, but also getting a lot of the baseball merchandise, including the Rowdy Rooster t-shirt so again i wanted to say a huge thank you to you guys i'm so grateful and, and so appreciative of you guys that take time out of your day to show love to the content support the content um share the content you know everything else and especially buy the merch and support the business that way and thank you guys so much for that because again the guy actually reached out to me and told me chris one of the things he was most impressed about was the passion of the TSUS fan base and how people interacted and how they, you know, showed appreciation for the merchandise and how they posted pictures of themselves wearing it. And that stuff goes a long way. I don't know if you guys think about that or whatever, but that goes such a long way when we're doing, you know, business transactions with people and business deals and they're seeing the brand and they're seeing you guys and how you interact and stuff like that. So Long story short, I just want to say, start this show off by saying thank you guys so much. We've locked in a new deal with Rivals in Florence, South Carolina, so it'll probably be two or three weeks, but more TSUS merch is coming to Rivals in Florence, South Carolina. Obviously, a huge deal for the business, for what we're trying to do, what we're trying to grow, what we're trying to build. So again, thank you guys so much, and let's keep this freaking momentum rolling. I'm fired up here on a Thursday because Gamecocks baseball normally we're talking series. We're waiting till tomorrow on Friday to give prediction and get the series going. No, no, it's game day today as Gamecocks baseball gets this series going in Baton Rouge, Louisiana against the LSU Tigers tonight. First pitch at 7.30 on ESPNU tomorrow night, 8 o'clock on SEC Network Plus, Plus. And then Saturday, 3 o'clock first pitch on SEC Network Plus. Again, all these times are Eastern Standard Time. Guys, quick reminder. Live stream watch along for all three games on YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter. You can join yours truly and watch all three of these ball games. Just want to let you guys know again if you're looking forward to that. Just want to let you know. Quick reminder again, let's break it all down. LSU, their head coach, Paul Maneri, uh, 2021 record this year. It's been a very interesting year for LSU baseball 20 and 12 overall, three and nine. In the SEC, guys, three and nine. I mean, that just does not sound right to say that LSU is three and nine in the conference. Lost two of three to Mississippi State on SEC opening weekend. Got swept at Tennessee. And, of course, we see what Tennessee's doing now. But this this was before Tennessee was Tennessee, I think, as we know now. Got swept against Vandy. And then actually took two of three at Kentucky. But three and nine in the SEC for LSU been a very, very disappointing season to this point for the Tigers. And a lot of that you can point to their pitching. Let's talk about that Tigers pitching staff because a 4.41 team ERA. That is so astronomically high for an LSU pitching staff. It's absurd. And one of the big reasons is this. Their ace, Jaden Hill, out for the season, went out a couple of weeks ago with Tommy John surgery. Even when he was pitching, he was not pitching all that great. But it's been such an up-and-down season for LSU, especially on the bump. Heck, Paul Maneri making changes right now. Literally, just before we came on, one of the LSU beat writers, Wilson Alexander, at WH Alexander underscore. You're welcome, Wilson, for the free plug. But <laughs> he said that apparently Paul Maneri said LSU is going to change up its bullpen a bit to, quote, see if we can't get a little bit more production, end quote. Freshman Theo Milis, Millis. Javen Coleman and sophomore Alex Brady will be on the active roster. They were not last week. And so LSU is just changing things up left and right. Again, Jaden Hill goes out. Your bullpen hasn't performed how they should. Again, a 4.41 team ERA. The Tigers are struggling on the mound. This is what the weekend rotation will look like, by the way, for the LSU. Uh, Friday, or excuse me, tonight, Thursday. See, I'm getting myself mixed up. I've got listed in my notes Friday, Saturday, Sunday, instead of Thursday, Friday, Saturday. I mean, I love the Thursday through Saturday series, don't get me wrong, but it is kind of throw me for a loop bit. So again, tonight, Thursday, April the 15th, 2021, LSU will roll out right-handed pitcher Landon Marceau, 3-3 three and three with a 1.89 ERA. Tomorrow night, Friday, they'll roll out right-handed pitcher A.J. Labus, 2-0 and o with a 3.43 ERA. And then Saturday, how about this? LSU is TBA, a place the Gamecocks have found themselves the past couple of weekends. 
But I will tell you this, for whatever reason, I've been able to watch a decent amount of LSU baseball this year. I will say Marceau is a big-time, legit guy. He is a legit Friday night arm. He is a legit arm the Gamecocks will have to face again, just like – you know, just like any other weekend, that's a given, right? You're not going to go out there and face a scrub on a Friday. I don't care which team in the SEC you're playing. Every single team in this league has got at least one guy who's a big-time dude. But again, a lot of shuffling, a lot of questions. Pulmonary is searching for answers when it comes to his pitching staff. Let's move to the hitting side of things. A 272 team average for LSU. They have swung it fairly well this year. Hit 52 home runs. In 32 games, that's not bad. 370 on base percentage, also 27 for 35 in stolen bases. So pretty athletic to go with that power as well. They've struck out 283 times, though. 283 times. So you'd think Gamecock pitchers should be able to have some success. Let's move into players to watch for, guys, because, again, there are really, really good players on this LSU baseball team. Please don't let the record, don't let the conference record, don't let that fool you. There are really good ball players on this LSU team. And you got to start with infielder, outfielder, Dylan Cruz. He can do a little bit of both, can play both infield and outfield, hitting 350 on the year, leads the Tigers on average. Tied for the team lead with nine home runs. He has 18 RBIs, also nine for 11 in stolen bases. And, oh, by the way, guys, he's a freshman. Some really good young talent on this team. Also, first baseman Trey Morgan, another freshman, hitting 328 on the year, four home runs, 27 RBI, a perfect eight for eight in stolen bases. And then you talk about infielder Gavin Dugas, 287, nine homers, 35 RBIs. Again, this is a typical LSU power bat type of ball club. Again, still marred by inconsistency, but they feel pretty good. If you read some of the comments from Maneri and some of their players, they feel good about their lineup. They feel good about their starting nine. They feel good about their offensive approach. They think they could be one of the best offensive teams in the entire SEC, just has not clicked yet. All right, let's move into things for South Carolina because there's been some interesting updates, and there are a ton, and I mean a ton of storylines going into this weekend. The first is this. How about the weekend rotation? Of course, tonight, Gamecocks will roll out running pitcher Thomas Thomas Farr. Excuse me. Tomorrow night, Friday, Gamecocks will roll out running pitcher Brandon Jordan. But Saturday... Gamecocks have been throwing a TBA out there past couple of weekends. I told you guys, Will Sanders must have changed his name to TBA. TBA no longer. Ryan, the pitcher, Will Sanders officially locked in. He will get the start on Saturday in game three for South Carolina. Again, I I think it's a good move. I I think it's a really good move. I think it's a smart move. You know, when you take a look at it, you take a look at best available. And I know they kept putting TBA to, oh, you know, if we need to use him Friday or Saturday or whatever. Dude, he's, he's one of your three best starters. He's just flat out one of your three best starters. And I think you need him in that, that game three role, that typical Sunday role, if you will. You need him in that game three role, though. And again, the way he's pitched, he has more than earned that spot in your rotation. So again, Will Sanders will get the ball officially on Saturday in game three. Let's move, guys, into our top storylines. What to watch for this weekend in Baton Rouge? And the first thing is this, guys. Hey, you thought Texas... Vandy and Florida was a gauntlet? Well, hey, guess what? The gauntlet 2.0 begins. Because you start, here you go, starting tonight. No midweek game next week, by the way. Starting tonight, you play three at LSU. You play three at home next weekend, Thursday through Saturday, against Arkansas, who's, by the way, the number one team in the country. Then you go to Ole Miss, who's in the top five in the country. And then the following weekend, You come home, right? You're like, oh, thank goodness we're coming home. You're playing Mississippi State. So you've got three basically top five teams and a very dangerous LSU team at their place this weekend. I would challenge fans and ask, you know, what's the record you're looking for? That's something I haven't even really thought about before. I'm just kind of kind of just, you know, looking at the schedule. Because, you know, I remember going into going into Texas, Vandy, Florida, and you said to yourself, okay, we've got to go five and four or better. we got to find a way to go five and four or better. And you ended up going, what did you go, one in, what did you go, four and five? Something like that, but you swept Florida. So, and you were able to get the big series win over Georgia. So you were to get, able to get away with it. But, I, you know, I just wonder, and you, you know, us as fans, we can look ahead, right? We can put a, a record number on it and say, oh, this is what I, I want to see. This is what, how many wins I want to see. But I tell you what, when you look at the gauntlet, it's almost like you got to take advantage of this weekend. 
Because, man, the next three after this? I mean, that might be as tough a three-week and even a four-week stretch as anyone in college baseball has, honestly. So, again, the gauntlet begins tonight, part two. And really, the entire season's a gauntlet, right? It's the SEC. Every weekend's tough. There's no off weekends in the SEC. Hey, ask Vandy about off weekends, right? They thought probably they were going to roll over Georgia. No big deal. No, there are no off weekends in this league. So, the gauntlet 2.0 gets going tonight. It's going to be one hell of a next four weeks for Gamecocks baseball. But what an opportunity it is. Hey, what an opportunity. The next, what, 12 SEC games? You sit at eight and four right now? I'll tell you what, I think if you go six and six, I think you did a damn good job. I mean, honestly, I, I think you did a really good job to go six and six. I think that's pretty solid. You find yourself 14 and 10 with two SEC series to go. The goal was to get to 500 or better. If you can get to 16 and 14 or better, you're probably hosting a regional, bottom line. So, you know, it all starts this weekend. A tough one in Alex Box, but it's going to be a, a very fun next four weeks, if nothing else. One of the top storylines, if not the top storyline of this weekend is this. Can the Gamecocks finally solve their game one blues? And I joked about this after the Missouri series. You know, thank God game one's not on Friday. Because it seems like South Carolina, for whatever reason, has just not played its best baseball on Friday night. I don't know what it is. You know, we saw it against Mizzou. We saw it against Georgia. You know, I mean, you won the Florida game, but that thing went to 14 innings. You can argue you should have lost. We saw it against Vandy. We saw it against Texas. I mean, it's been a struggle for Carolina baseball this year on Friday night. I don't know, in game one. I don't know what it is. It's like I said, I joke that, thank God, game one's on Thursday night. But can Carolina find a way to come out of the gate stronger than it has? Again, I don't really know what the, the answer to it is. I know fans, are they, they, they scratch their heads and they're confused and they say, you know, why have we not played well on Friday night? Guys, I don't know. I, I genuinely don't know. But I can tell you this, you know, saying that, oh, game one is so pivotal. I mean, that's obvious, right? I, I, that's so obvious. Winning game one is huge. But you've seen a South Carolina ball club that the last two weekends, one of those being on the road and, of course, one at home, has lost game one and found a way to rebound and win the next two and take the series. And that's great. Like I told you guys, the rest of the season, nobody should question this team's resiliency, their toughness, their, their win-anyway mentality, their battle mentality. Nobody should question it. This team is going to fight for everything it gets. But with that being said, you play with fire long enough, you, you are going to get burned. Bottom line, the league is too tough. You keep losing game ones, and eventually you're going to lose a series when you put your back against the wall in that way, can South Carolina find a way to play its best baseball tonight? Can South Carolina find a way to get this series started on a high note and get Thomas Farr his first SEC win? That's another huge thing in this series. I mean, the guy still doesn't have an SEC win. Still doesn't have one. It's unbelievable. And I know he hasn't pitched his best of late, but he's pitched well enough to win a game. I can promise you that. I, I know fans love to, to throw it out there, you know, about Thomas Farr. Should he be moved in the rotation? You know, I had somebody ask, should he even be in the weekend rotation? Like, what are you talking about? Look, go back and look at the games. He needs help. That's the problem. He needs help. The guy needs help. So, can South Carolina play a complete ball game on a Friday night and find a way to get the job done? Excuse me. On a, see, I keep saying Friday night. Thursday through Saturday, Chris. Thursday through Saturday, Thursday through Saturday. Can South Carolina find a way to play a complete game tonight in game one and get the job done and, and get off to a positive start in the series and have a chance in game two to win a series instead of having to play with your back against the wall and, and put it all on Brandon Jordan, if you will. Another thing I'm looking forward to from this weekend, guys, is, you know, I talked about LSU's lineup. And, again, they've struggled a lot this year. Again, the overall record speaks to that, 20-12, and 3-9 and nine in the SEC. They lost their last time out 
Um, hasn't been the year that LSU fans, I think anybody in that LSU community expected. But I think pitching's been more of their problem. Again, 272 as a team average is pretty solid and 52 home runs. You know, LSU can swing it a little bit, no question. But I look at the pitching matchup this weekend with, you know, LSU having Marceau, Labus, and a TBA, and the Gamecocks having Farr, Jordan, and Sanders. You know, the old adage in baseball goes, great pitching beats great hitting, right? I, you, you take a look at, you know, really even the team that wins the College World Series, but especially the Major League World Series. The team who has the best pitching, the team who pitches the best, is the one that wins the title, right? The old adage is great pitching beats great hitting. My question and what I'm watching for is this. Will great pitching beat great hitting yet again this weekend? Because that's the big matchup. I think if South Carolina's pitchers, if they continue to do their thing and stay hot, I think it could be a really successful weekend for Carolina. I really do. Because as inconsistent as the Gamecocks lineup has been, I, I think they'll do enough, you know, against an LSU staff that has struggled. Call for what it is. They've struggled. And, of course, it's not a given that South Carolina's lineup is going to come out and do their thing because, hey, you never know. This, this lineup, the hitting, it comes and it goes. And you just got to hope it's there, right? But will great pitching beat great hitting yet again? Because you look at those LSU offensive stats and you look at the certain guys they have and the players to watch for and all that. But South Carolina's got some damn good arms. You know, the statistics on the Gamecock side are by no accident. South Carolina's got pitching depth, real pitching depth. Far Jordan Sanders as good of a as good of a weekend rotation as you'll find in the SEC, in my opinion. What you've got in the back end, as good as you'll see in this league. Bottom line, good as you'll see in the league. Will great pitching prevail yet again? Because even in the series, you know, against Mizzou or even Georgia, all of them really, you know, offense is what's flashy, right? And that's across baseball. Offense is what's flashy, the home runs. That's what kind of a that's what sticks out in our minds, right? But I mean, this Gamecocks pitching staff. When South Carolina, you know, has come back in these past two series, it's because they're pitching dominated flat out. Guys like Brandon Jordan, guys like Will Sanders, guys like Julian Bosnick, guys like Brett Carey, guys like Danny Lloyd, Jack Mahoney. I could just keep going down the list. Andy Peters. Those guys have been dominant. Can they do that again this weekend? Because if South Carolina is going to win this series, you're going to have to lean on them, bottom line. On the road, you're going to have to lean on them. Something else I'm watching for, guys, moving to the hitting side of things. Let's move in the batter's box. Everybody wants to talk about West Clark. <laughs> Everybody's worried about West Clark, man. I tell you, it's funny. Everybody's worried about West Clark. You know, and the question is this, can Wes Clark snap out of his recent slump? Why is he slumping? Who knows? But he doesn't like the West Clark from the beginning of the year. But, hey, guys, he wasn't going to hit 700 all season. I'm speaking more so to the worry wart fan that thinks Wes Clark stinks now or that, God forbid, thinks he needs to be moved down the lineup. Baseball's a very hard game. You're going to go through your ups. You're going to go through your downs. Bottom line, that's just part of the game of baseball. Wes Clark is currently going through a dip. What is it? I have no idea. Is it probably mental? Probably so, because that's how most of the game plays out. He's still the same player, you know? He's still the same player. I'm sure he's working with Stuart Lake and, and, and got in the cage and watched the film and done everything he needs to do to be successful. But this is a big-time SEC weekend on the road. You need your guy, like Wes Clark in that four-hole. There's going to be more than one occasion. I can guarantee you that he comes up in a position where, hey, we need a knock. If nothing else, we need a productive A-B. Can Wes Clark snap out of that slump? Because he's not going anywhere, folks. He's going to be in that four hole. Bottom line, he is going to be in that four hole. He's going to be there. Can he figure out a way to, even if he doesn't have one of those crazy Wes Clark weekends, even if he doesn't do that, can he find a way to be a productive member of this Carolina lineup this weekend? Because you got to have him. It's just going to be really hard to win this series if he goes over the weekend. It is. It's just going to be hard to win. It's going to be very hard to win the series. So, can Wes Clark get it going? Recently named 
Mid-season Golden Spikes Award watch list. Tied for the NCAA lead in home runs. He's still that guy. Just a little cold right now. Can he get it going in Baton Rouge? Sticking to the batter's box in this Gamecocks lineup, something else I'm watching for, of course. I mean, this is an obvious question, I feel like. But which Carolina lineup shows up? You know, the inconsistency has been there. It hasn't been pretty at times. There's no question. And, of course, you have a lot of momentum right now. You know, you swung it well Saturday, Sunday against Mizzou. You swung it well against Charleston Southern, which we all expected. And you're facing an LSU pitching staff that has gotten hit around a little bit. Bottom line, they've gotten hit around. They've gotten hit around. Gave up 13 runs in their Sunday game at Kentucky. I know they won the series two out of three. But, hell, they lost 13-4 to four in the final game. Gave up 13, 11, and 5 at Vandy. And guess what? Vandy's lineup's not great. I mean, it's, it's, it's good. Don't get me wrong, but it's not great. Gave up 3, 9, and 3 at Tennessee. Okay, whatever. Gave up 6, 3, and 3 against Mississippi State. Again, okay, whatever. But the numbers speak. Which lineup is it? Which lineup is it? You know, you're going to need one through nine this weekend. Bottom line, you're going to need one through nine. You're going to need your guys to show up. Stay within yourself. Hey, I know you're on the road. I know you're playing LSU. Which that'll be another key to this weekend. You're not playing LSU and all of their national titles and all their history and all their accolades. You're playing the 2021 LSU Tigers that are currently unranked and 20 and 12 overall and three and nine in the SEC. That's how you have to approach this thing. And that moves me into the next thing I'm watching for, which is just from the college baseball perspective, South Carolina LSU, man, what a matchup. I mean, a matchup between two traditional college baseball powers. But if you're South Carolina, and I, I don't think this will be an issue, but for some teams it would be. If you're South Carolina, you need to approach this like any other ball game. And I know that's tough. That's much easier said than done because, again, you're at their place. You're on the road. The intensity of the SEC. Hey, you're going to be on ESPNU. You're going to be on national television. Much easier said than done to just ho-hum. We're just going to play it like we're playing Charleston Southern. I get it. But, again, you're not playing LSU in all their titles. You're not playing LSU in all their history. You're not playing LSU in all their tradition. You are playing the 2021 LSU Tigers. And that's not to say – LSU sucks or to take them lightly, but don't make them out to be more than they are. They put their pants on the same exact way you do. They lace the cleats up the same exact way you do. And hey, guess what? You're the favorite this weekend. Carry yourself as such. But again, what I'm looking forward to, just a great weekend for college baseball, man. A great weekend for college baseball. You know, we are so lucky and fortunate to cheer for a team like the University of South Carolina that has the type of tradition and expectations we do and get to go on the road to play LSU again. It's just, it's as good as college baseball gets. I know LSU hasn't been good this year, but it's as good as college baseball gets. It really is to see these two teams play. And it's fun because South Carolina doesn't normally play LSU. So to get to watch these two play, I'm just mad I'm not there. Unfortunately, the trip to Baton Rouge fell through. I was thinking about going, didn't work out. Just made more sense to stay in Columbia, stay on the home front, and take care of business stuff. But you know what? Still cannot wait. Cannot wait to watch all three games. Final thing I'm watching for, guys. Final thing I'm looking forward to. Like I mentioned, this game at Alex Box, one of the great venues in all of college baseball, right up there with Founders Park in Baton Rouge. We, we just I, I feel like with LSU, it's just like a staple of them that it, it's hard to play there. Their fans are crazy. They're loud. You hey. We talk about the Rowdy Roosters. We talk about some heckling. Our guys are going to get heckled this weekend. There's no question they're going to get heckled. Can you be the road warriors in Baton Rouge? I think this team has actually held its own very well on the road. I know you got swept at Texas. I think that hardened this team. I know you lost two or three at Vandy, but, hey, you took the final one, and the momentum that came from that I, I think has been huge. And you finally had success taking two out of three at Georgia. I think that was huge there as well. And I know Georgia Foley Field, it's nothing like what you're going to see this weekend. But the road warrior mentality in Baton Rouge, you got to embrace it. I, I don't, you know, 
hey, whatever. I'm just going to say it. I, I don't think South Carolina's got a bunch of bitches on their team like Mizzou and Florida showed. I think our guys will embrace it. I think our guys will embrace the adversity. I think they'll embrace the heckling. I think they'll embrace the, you know, the challenge of playing on the road, of winning on the road. I think our guys will do that. So, again, taking on that road warrior mentality in Baton Rouge. Let's move, guys, on a key player for this weekend. And, you know, I'll tell you, I went back and forth on this because I try not to get repetitive with these. You know, I try to not name the same guy every weekend or anything like that. But I named this guy a couple of weeks ago, so it's been a little while. And I went back and forth on it. But, guys, like I mentioned earlier, I know it's obvious, but game one tonight, game one is so important. And you saw it on Tuesday against Charleston Southern. Heck, you've seen it every time Brandon Jordan's taking the ball. The pitcher sets the tone for the ball game. He sets the tone. Bottom line, he sets the tone. And, you know, you've gotten away with losing game one and winning the series. But if you play with fire long enough, if you play with fire long enough, you're going to get burned. You can't make a living doing that. Not in this league, you can't. You just flat out can't make a living doing that. So my key player for this weekend is Ryan a pitcher, Thomas Farr. And I'm not trying to say it's all on him. Certainly it's not. The Gamecocks have not played well around him. You saw the errors last weekend. You saw the lack of hitting the previous weekend. South gonna has got to do more around this guy. They got to give this guy some help. But on the flip side, Thomas Farr has not thrown his best baseball. He, he, he has not pitched his best game. Not even close. And I'm sure he would admit that. Skyler Meade would admit that. Mark Kingston would admit that. And I'm admitting that. He hasn't pitched his best baseball, bottom line. Control issues have plagued him a couple of different times. And, hey, people are going as far as to question his spot in the rotation. That's how far it's gone with fans. Thomas Farr is a legit big-time Friday night guy in the SEC, game one guy in the SEC, however you want to phrase it. He is. He's legit, folks. This guy's legit. I don't just say that to blow smoke up your ass. 96 to 97 with the fastball. The breaking stuff is disgusting. A true competitor, bulldog on the mound. This guy has big-time legit stuff. But like I said, game one is so pivotal. You you, you cannot keep playing with fire and not expect to get burned at some point, especially against a really hungry and desperate LSU team. You know, LSU is still trying to make the postseason, guys. And sitting at three and nine in the SEC, 20 and 12 overall, they got to start winning and they got to start winning soon, like right now. Thomas Farr, in my mind, is going to set the tone for this weekend. And, of course, he's going to set the tone for the ball game, but he's going to set the tone for this weekend. And you need the best version, or as close as you can get to it, of Thomas Farr. We need Thomas Farr to be Thomas Farr. You got to be that guy. You know, this entire team is leaning on you. They're looking at you. You are in that spot. You are in that role for a reason. And again, I went back and forth on, you know, maybe it's Brandon Jordan, maybe it's Braylon Wimmer, maybe it's somebody else. But getting off to a good start in this series on the road is so pivotal. It is. And again, you need everybody else around him to help him out. Bottom line, it's not just all on him. He can only do so much. Hey, if you don't score, don't matter what he does. But Thomas Farr is going to set the tone in this ballgame. I think he's going to set the tone for the entire weekend. I do. And just for, I mean, heck, not even not even just for this series, but for the rest of the season and, and calming the nerves, I guess, of the fan base and and probably, I'm sure, calming the nerves of Skylar Mead and Mark Kingston. Like, you need to feel good about your game one guy. And if he has another bad outing, God forbid, if he has another bad outing, people are, you know, the, the, the chatter is only going to get louder. People are just going to continue to question it. They're going to continue to question him, his abilities. Should he be in that slot? Should he be in the weekend rotation? The volume's only going to get louder. So again, my key player for this weekend, and I think a guy who desperately needs a good outing, not just for this ball club, for himself, for this weekend, for the rest of the season, right-handed pitcher Thomas Farr, my key player for this weekend, against the LSU Tigers. And again, he will take the bump tonight in Baton Rouge. Guys, let's move into my prediction again. Normally, 
We don't have prediction until Friday, but of course, with the series starting tonight, I'm going to lock it in. Let's lock in my prediction as Carolina takes on LSU at Alex Box Stadium. You know, for whatever reason, I feel really good about this weekend. I'll be honest. I, I do. I, I, and I, I'll say this, though. With that being said, I know a lot of fans are going to look at the overall record. They're going to look at the SEC record. They're going to look at the statistics. And it's just like with Mizzou, and I am not comparing Mizzou and LSU, but it's kind of like with Mizzou in the sense of, you know, the game's not played on paper, right? And fans can get lost, and even I can get lost in the stats and and, and the home run numbers and the ERAs and and this and that, whatever, and the records. But, hey, I'm going to tell you guys right now, you don't go play baseball at LSU if you suck. (laughs) Okay, like, they might not be having the type of season they want to be having, but it's not like they got 35 guys who suck at baseball. They're good. I tried to say the same thing after UNC. You don't go to UNC if you suck. Okay? You just don't. And you don't go to LSU if you suck. So, if you're listening and you've got your mind made up, oh, if we don't sweep, it's a bad weekend. You're setting yourself up for disappointment. You know, but like I said earlier, the the gauntlet 2.0 begins. And you take a look at the next four weekends, this one, even with it being on the road, I definitely say is your most winnable and the easiest of the next four. And again, that's not saying LSU is easy, but just when you compare the rest of the teams you're playing, LSU is the easiest by far. I don't think there's any question. I feel good about South Carolina in this series. I really do. You know, I, I love the pitching matchup. I, I think obviously when you just look at far Jordan Sanders versus a You know, an LSU starting rotation, they've literally lost their ace for the season. You've got Marceau, Labus, and TBA. They don't even know who the hell's throwing Saturday. And it sounds like they're not going to make the decision until day of. You know, I like the matchup there. You know, I talked about earlier, I think great pitching will beat great hitting. I think LSU can certainly swing it, but I think the Gamecocks have got the arms to combat that. And then offensively, yes, there's inconsistencies. I mean, I, I do think, though, you'll get enough out of this lineup this weekend. However, the, I will say this. The one thing that scares me about this weekend, you are going to be facing a hungry and desperate LSU ball club. Make no mistake. I mean, this is a series that I think LSU is looking at and saying to themselves, we have got to take two or three here. We, we have to. We just flat out have to. At home we got to take two out of three. We cannot afford to drop this one. So you're going to get LSU's best shot. There's no question in my mind. You're going to get LSU's best shot. Because I'll be honest with you guys, like I looked at the series and I said, you know what? I don't know what it is or why I feel this way, but I could see Carolina sweeping this. I really could. And, hey, if you take game one, if you take that one tonight and Thomas Farr gives you his best stuff, you certainly could take it. You, You really could. But even if you do, I I just think I think picking the sweep is way too aggressive. I do. It's hard for me to believe that this hungry, desperate LSU bunch that still has good ball players, by the way, still has really, really good ball players. It's just hard for me to fathom that at home, they won't find a way to scratch out at least a dub, one dub. I don't know which game it'll be. I don't know. I can't tell you that, but it's hard for me to believe they won't find a way to scratch out one dub at home against Carolina. But with that being said, like I told you guys, I I think the lineup will do enough. I think Brady Allen leading the charge. I think Wes Clark will snap out of his slump again. Does he hit four or five home runs this weekend? No, I don't think so. But I think he will swing it better than he has of recent. You've seen a guy like David Mendham come on. I think Andrew Eister's coming on. Hey, maybe Brennan Malone. The bottom of your lineup's been much better. I think this lineup overall, I know it's been inconsistent, and so who knows what we're going to get, but I think you will get enough from that bunch. And again, I just think great pitching beats great hitting. I think great pitching beats great hitting, and while LSU's got sluggers up and down their lineup, 283 strikeouts. I think you'll be able to take advantage of their aggressiveness And I just simply think Carolina's got guys that are just flat out better. They got better stuff. They're better than you. 
And I think they'll show that this weekend. So I've got the Gamecocks going into Baton Rouge, getting a huge series win and taking two of three from the LSU Tigers. Like I said, guys, for whatever reason, I, I was about to start recording. I almost wrote down Gamecock sweep. And I was just like, you know what? That feels, a, I mean, I'd love to see it. What a huge weekend that would be. But I was like, you know what? That just feels a little aggressive. That feels a little aggressive. So I think this is a dangerous LSU team. I think it's a, a hungry, fired up. I mean, you're going to get LSU's best shot. But I think the Gamecocks are going to give LSU their best shot as well. And I think South Carolina's best versus LSU's best right now, South Carolina's best is better. And I say that, if you can hear it, with the scythe in hand. Souls shall be claimed this weekend as Carolina takes two of three from the LSU Tigers. So, again, guys, that's going to do it all for the LSU series preview and my prediction as well. First pitch tonight, 730 on ESPNU, and then, of course, tomorrow night, 8 o'clock on SEC Network Plus, and then Saturday, 3 o'clock on SEC Network Plus as well. Going to be one hell of a weekend, guys, and again, the live stream watch-alongs for all three games. Be sure to stay tuned to that, and, of course, all our coverage on social media going to be an absolute blast this weekend. I mean, South Carolina LSU, man, what more could you ask for? It's college baseball that's finest. I cannot freaking Wait, all right, a couple of news and notes real quick, just a couple of tidbits, and then we'll jump in your listener questions and get into our interview as well. Um, let's see. Wes Clark, like I mentioned earlier, named midseason watch list for the Golden Spikes Award. How about Jadavion Clowney, by the way, signing a one-year $10 million deal with the Cleveland Browns? Hey, I guess if you got to if you got to uh if you gotta move to Ohio. You might as well do it for $10 million. I was just thinking to myself, God, going to the Browns, that sucks. Then I saw how much he was getting paid, and I was like, you know what? I think I'd move to Ohio for $10 million. I think I'd do a lot of things for $10 million. I think I'd move to a lot of different places for $10 million. So with that being said, all right, let's move into your listener questions. If I can get it pulled up because Instagram is being very stupid right now. Let's see. Instagram is not cooperating. Instagram is not cooperating. All right. We've got questions on Twitter as well. Let me dive into these first. Um, sorry. <laughs> we got a got a little rain delay here on the Spurs Up show. Got a little bit of a rain delay. Here we go. Got a couple of really good questions. At USC Swimmer, Dan says, and this is on Twitter again, would you rather fight a hundred duck-sized horses? Or one horse-sized duck. Again, 100 duck-sized horses. Or one horse-sized duck. I mean, you got to go 100 duck-sized horses, right? I mean, there's no way you're beating a horse-sized duck, right? I mean, there's just absolutely no way. So, I guess give me the... Give me the 100 duck-sized horses. I, I, I don't think that'd be fun either, but... You know, whatever. It is what it is. Uh, let's see. Cats at no SX Cats says, what is the earliest this baseball team can get eliminated from the College World Series for it to be considered a successful season? Cats. Let me address this question really quickly. Cats, if, if, if you are, I don't give a damn if you go two and Q. If on any planet... Going to the College World Series, if you go to the College World Series and you try to justify, I don't give a damn when you get eliminated, you try to justify the season was a disappointment or was not a successful season, you are just setting yourself up for, for failure and complete misery as a sports fan. I mean, no question. Do you? People have got to realize how hard it is to make it, to even get to Omaha. Like, it, it is incredibly hard. It is incredibly difficult. Incredibly difficult. So, to insinuate that if you were to get there and lose your first game or your second, like, whatever, if you, no. If you get to Omaha, you accomplished your goal for the season. Flat out, bottom line. And if you want to disagree, 
That's totally fine. You're entitled to that. But if you start getting to a point, if you start getting to a point where you're saying, oh, man, well, you know what? We didn't win the whole thing, so it's a bad year. That's a very slippery slope slope as a fan. And again, you are setting yourself up for failure. All right, last question here on Twitter comes from at Taylor Dively, the, the Dively brothers. What is going on? Gamecock Nation has healed itself in the last couple of weeks, and it's been beautiful to see. Great to hear from Taylor Dively. Taylor says, we've had a pretty steady lineup for a few weeks aside from the UNC game and game one of Mizzou when Mahoney played third. Do you foresee any changes to the batting order this series? How much of a leash do you give far as our Friday night guy before throwing someone else on Friday? Thursday night game, Thursday night guy this weekend, I guess. Let's talk about the lineup thing first. I I think you're going to see that same nine they've been rolling with. I I don't think you're going to see any crazy, you know, Jack Mahoney at third or or any type of big crazy changes. I think that nine you put out there on Saturday and Sunday and basically on Tuesday, that's your best nine. I'd be absolutely shocked to see any changes to the lineup. I I, I don't think you'll see it. Again, I think that is your best nine. So I think they'll roll with that. And he also says, how much of a leash do you get far as our Friday night guy before throwing someone else on Friday? I I think Thomas Farr is our Friday night guy. Bottom line game. He's our game one guy. Bottom line. Okay. At some point, sure. You know, if he has a couple back, you know, if he has, we'll say this week and the next, if he has back-to-back really bad outings, you start to consider it. Maybe you pitch Jordan. Maybe you go Sanders. I don't know. But I think Thomas Farr would have to pitch so astronomically bad. And I don't think he's going to do that. I really don't think he's going to do that. You know, again, we've been complaining about his performance. I think I'm not trying to sit here and say Thomas Farr has been lights out, but he's also got no help. He's gotten no – look at his statistics. Thomas Farr has been as good as anybody in the SEC, but he's getting no help. That's the problem. That is the problem. So, find a way to help your guy out. He's done enough. He's done enough for you to get you wins in game one. Help him out. Got to help him out. All right, we finally got Instagram pulled up. Last two questions here. Austin underscore Riggs, 12. How will we match up to a decent LSU team on the road with our lack of road success? Well, last series on the road, you won. Took two or three from Georgia. And, uh, you know, you say, you say lack of road success, but, I mean, the two series losses on the road were Texas and Vandy. And, dude, have you seen the rankings? Those are two top five teams. So, you know, I think we'll be fine on the road. I do. Again, I think it's going to be a desperate, hungry LSU team, but I think we'll be fine on the road. I think this team has the right leadership, the right makeup. They'll embrace the challenge. Last question. Brendan underscore Krieg. If the boys sweep and take the midweek, what's the highest you see them in the standings? So we took the midweek already. If Carolina was to sweep, I mean, a lot of it would depend on what teams ahead of you did, but at minimum, this would be a top 10 team. At minimum. Absolutely at minimum. No questions asked. Hey, if you win two or three, you're in the top 10, in my opinion. No doubt. If you win two or three in the top 10. So if you sweep, who knows? But hey, just find a way to win the series. That's all we're asking for. All right, guys. Appreciate the listener questions. Let's go into our interview. Birch Antley from SEC Network Plus has done the play by play for Gamecocks baseball. Awesome conversation. Truly appreciate Birch taking the time. You know, it's crazy. It feels like it's been, it's been years in the making. We've been interacting with each other on social media for what feels like forever. It was awesome. Great convo. Great stuff here on a Thursday. It's all brought to you by our friends over at Manscaped. Guys, flowers are blooming. The grass is growing, and it's time to chop the weeds. Thanks to our sponsor, Manscaped. You can trim your holes safely and efficiently. I'm talking about ball trimmers, of course. Manscaped, the global leaders in men's blow the waist grooming, have an exclusive offer for our audience, use the promo code TSUS. That's promo code TSUS. Get 20% off plus free shipping at manscaped.com. Guys, join the other 2 million men who trust Manscaped. They are here to make sure you are trimmed and smelling nice. After all, it is time for some spring cleaning. Guys, spring is sprung. Manscaped has the best tools to get you ready. Guys, we've all been there, right? We're trimming up. We get a cut, a nick. We're bleeding. It stings. It's no fun. It's no bueno. Don't leave yourself subject to that. Upgrade. It's time to. Manscaped are global leaders in men's blow-the-waist grooming, 
and it forever changed the grooming game with their amazing products. Guys, they're here to help you with your above-the-waist holes, too. Have you guys heard of their Weed Whacker? Get this right. Their nose and ear hair trimmer provides proprietary, proprietary that's a tough word to say, proprietary skin-safe technology, which, help, which helps prevent nicks, snags, and tugs in those delicate holes. Guys, no more gross nose hairs flying in the wind, guys. The premium Manscaped Weed Whacker uses a 9,000 RPM motor-powered, 360-degree rotary dual-blade system. Manscaped is making whacking your weeds a time to look forward to, delivering maximum confidence while providing hygiene. And guys, speaking of incredible hygiene, Manscaped has formulations that keep you fresh and ready for everything that comes your way all day. Guys, the crop preservers and anti-chafing ball deodorant and moisturizer are starting to get hot. It is really starting to get hot in Columbia, no question. So it's crucial. Your ball stops sticking to your leg. That's legit the worst. You're also going to find the Crop Reviver spray-on toner for your balls, which will keep you smelling fresh down there, just like spring flowers. Speaking of smelling fresh, complete your grooming game this spring with the new refined cologne signature scent by Manscaped. Guys, this stuff is legit. I swear by that thing, by the way. It'll have you smelling like royalty. The cologne is light, approachable, and gentlemanly in all the right ways. You will be the talk of your next hangout. Guys, smell good, feel good this spring. Again, get 20% off and free shipping with promo code TSUS at manscaped.com. That's 20% off and free shipping with the code TSUS at manscaped.com. Guys, it's spring cleaning and your balls will thank you. Do yourself a favor and always use the right tools for the job. Again, guys, thank you so much for tuning in. Now, enjoy this interview with Gamecocks Baseball SEC Network Plus play-by-play man, Birch Antley. <laughs> All right, joining me today on the Spurs Up show, guys, very exciting interview. You guys are going to recognize his voice the second he speaks. But uh, a guy that's been in the play-by-play world, play-by-play business for quite a while, he's called different games on ESPN3, SEC Network, NFHS Network uh, since 2009, also went to South Carolina back in the early 90s. And a fellow Newberry guy, we are joking off air, it's kind of a rarity I get to talk to a, a fellow Wolf, I guess it would be now. But obviously, you guys are going to recognize him. Calling South Carolina baseball since 2016 on the SEC Network Plus stream. So, hey, if you were tuning in the game on Tuesday night or any game this season, for that matter, you've heard his voice, Birch Antley, taking the time to chat with me today. Birch, appreciate you taking the time, man. It's a pleasure to have you on, like I told you, jokingly off here. I feel like this has been uh, I feel like this has been in the works for quite a while, man. I feel like we've been interacting on social media since the days of the Spurs Up show or before it was even called the Spurs Up show, having like 100 followers. I don't know. We've seemed to... We've seen to run into each other quite a bit on uh, on social media, but seriously, man, appreciate you taking the time. It's it's awesome to have you on. Hey, thank you, man. I'm just uh, honored to be here and, and really appreciate you extending the invitation. Absolutely. So, Birch, I want to go back to the beginning for you because, again, like we we're talking, you went to South Carolina, finished up at Newberry, uh, obviously got your degree in communication. So I'd assume, you know, that was kind of what you wanted to do. But, you know, I, I did some play-by-play stuff when I was in college, just kind of for the USC Aiken baseball team, which shout out to them, by the way. But I, I'm curious, for you, was it always something, you know, you knew you wanted to do that? I know that in, I was looking over your uh, your accolades, 1998 newscaster of the year by the South Carolina Associated Press. So again, you were always, always in that communications world, but just how did that come about, I guess? Like, did you know that play-by-play was what you wanted to do, or were you just kind of like, hey, let me get the degree, get into that sphere, and kind of whatever happens, happens? Well, no, not really. At first, uh, I wanted, you know, as a kid, I wanted to be a doctor. And then I wanted to, that, you know, realized I wasn't very good in science or math. So I said, well, uh, let me change that. And uh, so like freshman year in high school, I was like, well, I guess I'll, you know, be a businessman or something, you know, and major in business and go to Carolina because I was a lifelong Gamecock fan. But then I just happened to be in the right place, at the right time and grew up in a small town, Batesburg, Gleesville, South Carolina. And my sophomore year in high school, a job came available, uh, after school job at the local radio station, little small AM country and Western radio station in town. And I happened to get it and it just stuck with me and loved it. And I was always a big sports fan and played baseball or sat on the bench, really, to be honest with you and and kept the scorebook and coach first base. But, uh, um, you know, it it just kind of fell into my lap and I loved it. And it just, you know, stuck with me. And I said, you know what, this is what I want to do for the rest of my life. And, uh, you know, it, it came about where I spent a lot of time in school, was mm-hmm. at USC for six years, didn't finish here, transferred over to Newberry, and I got my degree in communications after a year and a half at Newberry, but uh, then started, just got lucky and got a job at WIS, and one thing led to another, and kept working at the local radio station as play-by-play voice for Baseball Louisville High School football, and 
just kept paying my dues kind of and, mm-hmm. and meeting people and being in the right place at the right time. And South Carolina High School League Network started, uh, was able to get that. And then that kind of led to greener pastures, so to speak, with mm-hmm. the opportunity that came about with the SEC Network. Yeah, I feel like it's definitely very much a pay your dues business, right? I mean, it's it's one of those where you really have to cut your teeth per se, and there's a lot of uh, free work or work that is not the most desirable, which again, no, no slight to anybody, but I think it was Mike Yuba was telling me he was like covering middle school girls volleyball or something like that, like in Mississippi or something crazy. Like, yeah, but it's a very like pay your dues business. Well, I'll ask you this, was it something that you felt like in the beginning you were sort of a natural at, or did you feel like you really evolved as you went along? Yeah, I felt like, you know, I had to, you know, to put a golf analogy to it, I had to go to the Hooter store and then, you know, excel there and right. then, you know, keep making those steps and keep putting the reps in. And, and you know, I, I really didn't feel like I was ready until I was ready, I guess. And you're always trying to get better. Um, you're only as good as your last broadcast, really. Right. Uh, so it was something that, you know, I, I wanted to make sure that, you know, I kept working at it and working at it. And, and uh, uh, it kind of came about, you know, around 2015, 2016. I said, you know what, I just want to do this full time uh, and really make it my career and really dive into it uh, as deeply as I possibly can and, mm. and, and move it that way. And uh, just, you know, you keep working, you keep getting the reps in and you just never say no, really. If a, if a job opens up, you say, yep, I'll take it. You know, I'll do the best I can. And, and, you know, you try to uh, put in as much effort beforehand uh, as far as research goes, preparation. Uh, a lot of people don't realize, you know, you just don't show up mm. uh, into the broadcast booth. Um, it takes a lot, you know, beforehand, just behind the scenes I probably put in, you know, for a three hour, three and a half hour baseball game, uh, I would say at least 15 hours, maybe Mm. sometimes 20 of prep work just before that. Mm. And that's a lot of like studying the rosters and the coaches and the trends and the statistics and all that stuff that, again, people, you just kind of spout off on the broadcast, but people don't realize like that's, you know, that stuff I kind of relate with, you know, putting together notes for the podcast and stuff like that. There's a lot more to it than just, getting behind the mic or whatever, getting on the headset and just kind of going like you're obviously, you know, because if you're not prepared, it's going to be painfully obvious on that broadcast. Yeah. And then this year, you know, uh, you know, you've got to factor in what's going on with, you know, with COVID. Uh, and so we're required to take uh, every twice a week. Um, mm-hmm. We have to do, do a COVID test. Um, so, you know, you have to add that into the mix and I have to drive to Columbia. I live in Batesburg, Leesville, and mm-hmm. um, you have to, you know, make that drive, drop off your, your sample and find out right. if you've, made it safely so you can work this week or not Mm, for sure i i I want to ask you this birch because i I know i'm jumping around but again it's kind of crazy like we're chatting here because we come from two different i guess spheres if you will and in the sense of like how much sports media has changed in the sense of like we're just talking that you know communications and and definitely doing that whole thing that there's a lot of merit to it but it's a lot of cutting your teeth working for free working tough jobs and just trying to get that big break versus now I feel like social media has changed the game in the sense like you don't really have to do that anymore. I mean, if you can go on social media, be personable, have a personality, you can kind of just build your own thing and not have to. I mean, you are technically, I guess, cutting your teeth, but it's a much different type of grind and much different type of journey. I'll ask you because, again, you've seen the evolution of social media since you've been doing play by play. And I asked Andy Demetra about this as well. But how crazy, I guess, has it been to watch that? Because you're somebody that's pretty active on social media, I feel like. And if somebody tweets at you, I feel like you're, you're pretty good about like responding and talking to people and stuff like that. But how crazy has that been to just see the way that sports media has evolved with social media kind of taking over? I think it's really been, you know, a, a good thing. Uh, it's, you know, paved the way for people to, to just get out there. Um, and if you don't have that opportunity where, you know, there's a, let's say there's a local radio station in town, you can kind of create your own now. Mm. Uh, you can even, you know, take a microphone to a local high school baseball game and, and you know, kind of sell it yourself and sit in the bleachers and, and call play by play that way and, and just kind of get some reps in and get, get the practice in. Uh, one thing I do try to tell, you know, people that are trying to start out, especially young uh, uh, up and coming broadcasters is, you know, don't do things for free mm. because it makes it, <clears throat> harder on everybody else because uh you know really and truly people are not tuning in for birch Antley. they're tuning in because they want to watch the game right uh, and unfortunately sometimes in our business you know a camera is worth more than than the talent 
Mm-hmm. <laughs> and so uh, the powers that be will put more emphasis on that as far mm-hmm. as you know financial rewards. Uh, they're going more toward you know the the technical side as because they feel like you know well hey we've got these guys over here they sell they'll do it for free let's let's mm-hmm. grab them so I'm trying to you know tell people hey it's it's really not good for you know our industry mm-hmm. as far as broadcasters are concerned to you know sell yourself short you have to you know you're, you're valuable regardless mm-hmm. um, now sure go out there and take anything you, you can don't don't say no to jobs if you feel like you're you're qualified but. Uh, you know, don't sell yourself short. Mm-hmm. I, I certainly don't mm-hmm. try to advocate people doing things for free. Now, have you done radio? Company, uh, you know, up and coming doctors, of course, they, they, they don't, you know, <laughs> say, hey, I'll, I'll do your heart <clears throat> surgery right. for free. You know, it's, it's uh, <laughs> you know, they, they're going to get paid for it. Right, for sure. I, I was going to ask, so you've done both probably radio and I guess, you know, SEC Network Plus, we can, it's obviously TV. So you've done both. Do you prefer yeah, one over the other? And then got into TV. Yep. Do, do you prefer one over the other? I mean, I know there's obviously the joke of you have the face for, for radio or whatever. I mean, but like, do you, do you prefer doing radio or TV more? I guess I'm curious. I prefer, I think it's a lot harder to do radio because, you know, you have to paint the entire picture. The picture is already there on TV. You have to speak right. and, and narrate to what you're watching. Um, although today, you know, I think people that are watching broadcasts on uh, the digital side, you know, SEC Network Plus and, and really, just about any network now mm. they're watching on their phone they're watching on their laptop they're watching you know on the go and they're doing other things so you still have to kind of at times treat it like a radio broadcast because you're not getting that full attention right um but you know really and truly i, I kind of look at my job as being a traffic cop uh, i'm there just to kind of you know make sure that uh, everything is flowing smoothly uh, and, and talk to the pictures and, and just add some, you know, some stories and add some flair to it. Uh, with radio, you've got to be, you know, mm-hmm. nonstop. You can't have any dead air and, and mm-hmm. you can let the game breathe more uh, in TV. So I do like that stuff. Yeah, I, I'm just fascinated, Birch, talking to you because it is crazy because e- even I remember like, I, I think it was like maybe 2008 or something or, or just times before, like, you know, we just take it for granted. Now we have SEC Network Plus and every single game is streamed, which you know, I, I think you'd probably agree that I think college baseball is still, you know, an untapped market. It's still underutilized. It's still under broadcast. It should be on TV more. But like, I remember like late 2000s, South kind of being in a regional and having to literally follow it on the game cast. Like there was yeah. not any streaming. I remember like 2010 and 11 when I was sitting in my dorm at Newberry, you know, watching those teams. And there was one guy, I think that had a camera above home plate. There was no audio, not, but like you, you had this one camera and there was this like, secret website i guess to add like all these college college team streams like i don't even know where this came from but whatever but like it's kind of crazy just when you really think about it again we take it for granted because we have all this technology but having sec network plus and it's like every single basically college especially the power five they have like a full broadcast um you know operation Go, they have all the cameras, they have all the mics, they have all the broadcasters. Like, it's kind of crazy when you think about it, that, that we have that at our disposal now. Yeah, and it's, you know, just for, let's say, for last night's game, for example, uh, South Carolina and Charleston Southern, SEC Network Plus broadcast, there's 20 to 30 people uh, working mm. that that broadcast. You All you hear is myself and you hear my analyst, Kip Balknight. Right. But the ones you don't see that are, are making sure that everything is looking good, and sounding good, there's you know 25 people there uh, that are that are working that. So mm-hmm. you know it's a it's a big deal. It's a big undertaking. And gosh, I remember you know growing up in in Batesburg, Leesville, and being a Gamecock fan, listening to Bob Fulton on the radio, and even Mike Morgan. There was only one station in the entire state that carried right. it. You had to live in Columbia to listen to South Carolina baseball on the radio. That right. kind of changed, you know when South Carolina got Ray Tanner and, and things really started to take off and, right. and all the trips to, to Omaha and the two national championships. For sure. I, you know, so obviously you grew up a Gamecock fan, went to the university of South Carolina and, and your co-host or, you know, your, 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 uh, your partner in crime, if you will, on the SEC network plus is Kip Balk Knight. How, how awesome has it been? Because I know that's a very unique relationship. You're kind of feeding off each other and going back and forth, and you kind of build that relationship of when he says something, how you say something, and you know you sort of feed off each other, if you will. But Kip, being a Golden Spikes Award winner, obviously his career in Columbia is is well documented. I guess you know how awesome has it been for you, not just the professional relationship, but you literally being a fan of the Gamecocks. I'm sure this is a guy 
that you watched him pitch at South Carolina. How cool has it been, I guess, picking his brain? And and I'm sure you guys off the air, like, talk, you know, old memories and kind of reliving those things. I'm sure you've you've learned a lot of baseball from him as well. Yeah, yeah. And it's, I mean, it was, you know, uh, huge. It's it's awesome. And especially, you know, uh, like you said, a Golden Spikes Award winner and, and what he has done, uh, not only, you know, on the field, but off in, in promoting the university. And it was awesome, you know, working with Trey, Di- uh, Trey Dyson and, uh, with Michael Roth and then on the basketball side, working with Khadijah Sessions and uh, Hall of Famer Alex English, you know, who's yeah. like you know, a hero to everybody uh, my age growing up. So it's been, you know, as a Gamecock fan, um, it's been a lot of fun. Now, when I am on the broadcast, though, however, you know, I have to I, c- I can't be a homer. I have to right, take right, that out. Right. You, you can't call the game one way or another because uh, it is a, a broadcast for, you know, fans Everyone. of. Every of every of college yeah. baseball, really, yeah. you know. So I have to be I have to be neutral. I have to call it like it is. Mm. Um, but you know, deep down, uh, am I pulling for one team or another? Of you know, if they're wearing garnet and black, yes. Yeah, I, I was gonna say too, though, Bert. You, you have to admit that, like you I, you watch some of these SEC Network Plus streams, and it, it's it's very obvious who they're going for. I mean, I think back to the Vanderbilt series. I I think to any time Carolina goes to Clemson, it's so painfully obvious who they're pulling for. So I respect that you guys do that and stay in the middle, though, because that's obviously what you should do. But it, I think it's just kind of funny to joke around with because it's like there, there's some of the guys. I don't know if they quite adhere to uh, to your philosophy quite as much as you do. I'll say yeah, that. Yeah, and it's funny because, uh, you know, I've been accused of being – uh, a Clemson fan <laughs> you know, <laughs> that I was talking about Seth beer too much or, yeah. or whatever. Um, so, and I kind of chuckle at that, you know, I was like, yeah, that's, that's pretty funny. And I guess uh, when I do hear comments like that, I said, well, you know, I'm doing my job then if, if that's what you think, because yeah, yeah. Uh, I am calling it, you know, middle of the road. Yeah. You know, you know, you're doing your job when both sides hate you. Uh, that, you know, that's, that's the best, <laughs> best thing I've ever heard. And it's, it's funny. Cause I'll see fans on social media, you know, Say and it's like it's almost like I'm like you know like a guy like Kip. It's like he's trying so hard to not be biased that people feel like he's being biased to the other side. It's right. but obviously it, people don't understand it. No, no. But what's it been like? I guess interacting with the Gamecocks fan base again. Of course, that's the side of it. You know, with social media, it's it's funny. People love to. I, I joked with my buddy about this. I think it was. I think it was the Georgia series. I don't know what series it was, but I told my buddy I was like, and, and Gamecock fans might get mad at me for me saying this aloud, but I'm like. Man, I I just have never met a group of people that complain so much about the play by play guys or the announcers of any, not just you, like any sport. Like, I, I, you, you got to love the passion because obviously they're the one, you know, you talked about the rowdy roosters on the on the telecast last night. And just I, there, there isn't a, a fan base. I don't know there's a fan base that matches the passion of Gamecock fans, but it makes you guys' lives very interesting. They keep you on your toes, that's for sure. Yeah, and you know, there was a time, I'll be honest with you, that when I used to, because, you know, I, in this business, it's very difficult to get feedback, mm. honest feedback. And it's something that I, I've always felt like, well, I can't get better unless I get feedback. So, it, you know, initially I, what I would do is after each broadcast, I would go right to the Internet and see, all right, well, what are people saying about me? And, you know, it was depressing. You know, you would I mean, you would just get wow, just blown away. It's like, oh man, I'm just, I must be terrible. You know, nobody likes me. And, uh, you know, I, you, you really get down. Then, you know, I realized, well, wait a minute, hold on. Uh, it seems like they're calling me for another gig. So mm. uh, I guess I'm doing okay because the people that are, that are wanting me to, that are employing me aren't, aren't saying bad things about me. Mm. Uh, and then you look at some of the things that are being said and you're like, wait a minute. Um, uh, I don't think they really, I didn't even say that. That wasn't even my broadcast. <laughs> so, so, and then you see where, you know, like people are ready to take Wes Clark out of the lineup because he is on a cold streak and right. they want to change, you know, Brady Allen as leadoff batter and like, eh, all right, maybe I shouldn't, shouldn't interact right. here and, and listen here because, uh, you know, people will complain about anything yeah. and you know, you're doing a good job. I think when people aren't saying you are, because yeah. they're not going to take the time to say, Hey, what a you know great call or what a good job that we're so thankful we have this guy you know if if they're talking about you then they're talking about you in hey as long as they're spelling my name correctly that's yeah. all i care about <laughs> 
Yeah, trust me, Birch. Been there, done that. I'm sure you've seen some of the uh, some some of the antics that I, I've dealt with over, over the times. But either way, it, we we love it. it. It's it's part of it, and it's uh like I said, it's great to see the passion from the Gamecocks fan base. Switching gears a little bit, Birch, because obviously, again, you you are doing the play by play thing. You've been doing it for a while. You've been doing a fantastic job, I might add. Now you you've had a long career, you know, in in, uh, in sports media, if you will. If you had to give advice to maybe somebody that's listening, or just anybody who maybe they're a student at the University of South Carolina, maybe there's somebody who just graduated, or maybe there's somebody that has always wanted to do it, and you know, maybe they're just kind of searching for a way to get started. You know, what would be your piece of advice to to a young either broadcaster, you know, media personality, media talent, if you will, what would be your one piece of advice to them? Always, you know, just stay humble to, you know, respect the, the business and respect that, you know, it, it just takes some time and, and uh, you know, try to work yourself into a situation where um, you're, you're going to set yourself apart, uh, you know, make yourself a little bit different. Uh, you know, say, hey, everybody wants to be the the, the, the guy for football, right? right? Right. But you know what? Volleyball pays pays the rent too. Uh, so does wrestling. So does lacrosse. So does a competitive cheer, whatever it may be. Uh, you know, and also, you know, help out. You know, be a part of the team. You know, learn how to do some of the technical side because you're yeah. adding value. Um, and and always, you know, be humble and and you can burn bridges very easily in this business. It's a, it's a tight knit group. Mm. Um, so, you know, make sure that you're not out there uh, on social media and, and, you know, flaming others and, and, and doing this or doing that, um, you know, just be kind, you know, and, and, and just be genuine and be who you are. Don't try to be anybody else. Mm. For sure. Birch, I'm curious. Again, you've been doing this since I think you said 2016 where you've done baseball, basketball. I, I think I probably most notably know you from baseball because, you know, tuning into every single – there's so many baseball games. So we hear your voice a lot during baseball season. Is there is there a favorite call or favorite moment for you from your time in the booth? And I, and I have to think of a couple games or one game specifically this year you were calling that probably is pretty close. But is there one moment, one, one, one call for you specifically that stands out? Uh, it's, gosh, I guess recently, uh, you know, I would have to kind of go back to last year maybe when Ty Harris hit the – 75 foot shot uh, right before halftime or right before the first period ended against uh, South Dakota State, I believe. I mean, she just flushed it, you know, it was Christmas time and, you know, it was right down the chimney, you know, and yeah. uh, it just kind of came to me. Uh, and I, I thought that was a, a great one. But, you know, as far as moments go, I don't think it gets any better really than, you know, Andrew Eister, the second walk off, you know, back to back against Clemson. Uh, and then just kind of, you know, watching the celebration. And then that 14 inning game against Florida, man. I mean, that was college baseball at its best. Mm. And gosh, I just wish that, man, if that was, if Founders Park could have been full then, I feel like, you know, a lot of people just kind of got cheated. Yeah. They, they didn't get to see that in person, but I did. How mm. lucky was I? And not only did I get to see that, witness it, but I got to talk about it mm. and tell people about it that, that were, were not there. Um, you know, that, that's a blessing right there just to be able to, to, to be in that moment in that situation, because that's one of the best all around college baseball games that I've ever seen. I mean, Andrew Eicher down to his last strike, down to his last strike, you know, and it, he just, you know, he ties it up. And then you're like, you're thinking, wow, all right, we're going to be here for a while. You forget about Jeff Heinrich, what he could do, yeah. you know, right up the middle. And then you've got Chris Burgess who comes up and just, bam, delivers it right in the gap there. And Carolina wins. And the way the reaction was, how everything happened, it was just one of those just unbelievable college baseball games. Uh, and I was so blessed to be a part of that. And I think that that was that was a lot of fun. And that's something I will remember for the rest of my life. Yeah, I was going to say it's it's Wednesday, April the 14th. I mean, it's been weeks since then. I still can't believe Andrew Eister hit that ball out 02. I can't believe. I, I've got chill bumps. I mean, seriously, yeah. it, it, when you I'm describing <laughs> it and and yeah. the hairs my arm just stood up, you know, talking yeah. about it, how amazing that was, you know, and we finished it, you know, 12:30 in the morning. Yeah. That 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 swing is up there with the Jackie Bradley Jr. in the College World Series type of clutch in, in my mind. Right. I know it's a much different setting, much different stage, but Huge swing. And then I, I was going to say, too, I was at that Clemson game. That That's probably one of the best baseball games I've ever seen, uh, in, in person for sure. No doubt. No doubt in my mind. Um, on that note, before I let you go, Bert, you know, I'm really curious, again, just to get your take on, you know, you've seen Gamecocks baseball, you know, go through – 
I feel like a lot since you started calling games, you know, with Chad Holbrook and then, <clears throat> you know, shifting over to, to Mark Kingston and even during his time, the ups and downs. But I know you'd probably agree with me. You know, I was really high on this team coming into the season, felt good about the pitching staff and the pitching depth and what you had in the lineup. Just really overall felt like this was a complete team and we're seeing it right now. Again, we're talking on Wednesday, April the 14th, Gamecocks starting their series tomorrow against the LSU Tigers or tonight tonight when this interview is going to be coming out. But starting their series at LSU, but South Carolina right now sitting at 22-9, and 8-4 and four in the SEC, a game out of first place. Um, how fun has it been for you, and how impressed have you been with Mark Kingston's squad this year? Here's what's impressed me the most is the chemistry on that team <clears throat> and how that chemistry has come about within, when, you know, these are guys that a lot of them didn't meet each other uh, until the first time by zoom meetings, you know, uh, you know, they didn't have the workouts. You know, you've got Brady Allen working out in his backyard, you know, at home. Uh, and you know, the guy's ripped by the way. And, you know, you've, you've, the way that they have come together and the fun that they're having and the way that, you know, you, you see things happen where the guys are like, all right, you know what, I've got your back. You know, if, if, you know, I've, I've got you, you know, and then you see coach Kingston, you know, at Vanderbilt, when he got ejected, you know, he's coming out and he's saying, you know what, I've got my guys, you know, and, and to see that, that the chemistry, to see the mental makeup, the character on this team right now, uh, it's a thing to behold, especially the way it came together and the way it, it, it did with COVID, uh, you know, where you've got, you've got separate locker rooms, you know, it's, it's really amazing. And the fun that they get, these guys have, um, you know, the personalities that are there, uh, the way that they're taking things, you know, one game at a time, um, the way that, you know, you've got young guys that have come in like Will Sanders that are showing leadership right off the bat, like Jack Mahoney, a guy that, you know, broke his leg playing high school football. You know, he should have been done then. Right. Mm -hmm. But no, he goes back out and he says, I'm going to finish my, my senior year playing basketball because they need me. You know, I'm going to make sure that I rehab as hard as I can because my team needs me. Uh, in a sport that, you know, that's not his main sport. You know, yeah. he's going to college to play baseball, but yet his makeup is I'm that much of a team guy. And this is what I'm going to do. And, you know, he comes to Columbia and, you know, he's going to do anything that he can to help out the team. And I, I think that it's, it's amazing to watch that and to see that. And you've got guys that, you know, they're not belly aching about playing time. You know, they're, they're into it. The guys in the dugout are into it and you don't see that every day. And that makes a huge difference. And, you know, it's it's awesome to see, too, how the fans uh, and especially, you know, the the the, the students have, have come together and how the, the things that they're doing and the, the team is saying, hey, we need you. You know, it, it makes a difference when Founders Park is loud and we feed off of that. And when the coaches say, you know what, we feed off of that, too. Uh, it's an awesome thing to see. And I think it's only going to get better. And boy. You know, this Arkansas series that's coming up at Founders Park, if they can get, you know, more fans in, even if they can't, the, the ones that are going to be there, you know, they're going to make noise. And Rowdy Roosters be, will not be silent, Roosters, I promise you. I really appreciate what they're doing, you know, and, and it goes – I remember the third base hecklers over at Sarge Fry Field as a kid, you know, when June Reigns was the head coach. You know, and, and it makes a difference. It, it makes it, you know, where uh, a visiting team comes in and they're like, wow, you know, we, we really don't want to be here. You know, we're ready to go back home. Um, and it, it, it is the most awesome thing to see that you have that in college baseball where, you know, you don't really have that the next step up. Mm. Yeah, for sure. Like you said, if South Carolina can take care of business this weekend, win two out of three, no midweek next week, you know, top 10 matchup at Founders Park. I, I think that that Arkansas series will be as big a series that we've seen in Columbia in, in, in quite a long time. And I feel then like. we finish it up the regular season at home against mm. Tennessee. Who's the top five team right now? <laughs> yeah, and that could be, you know, this weekend, yeah. Vanderbilt, Tennessee, that's going to be, you know, for first place, really. Yeah, hell South of a Carolina series. still kind of sneak up in there. Yeah. But at the end of the regular season, it could be South Carolina, Tennessee doing battle for it at Founders Park. Yeah, yeah. The fact, hey, I would say this, Birch, the fact we're even having that conversation warms my heart. It honestly warms my heart after uh, 
after football and basketball. So, no, you love to see it. But seriously, man, you guys have been doing a great job, you and Kip both, but especially you, man, Birch. It's, it's great to tune in. And and uh, I, I've been at all the home games, but I did tune in. I missed the one Sunday, so I was listening to you guys. But, again, you guys continue to do a great job. Keep it up, man. I, I know Gamecock fans truly appreciate the job that you're doing. And, uh, yeah, seriously, have fun on the call. I know you won't be calling the games at LSU this weekend, but that Arkansas series, I know you're probably – Looking forward to that one. So for that series and the rest of the year, man, wish you best of luck and appreciate you taking the time. Let's definitely do it again soon for sure, man. Hey, anytime, man. I really appreciate what you're doing and uh, tell the Rowdy Roosters we appreciate them and, and we appreciate you. Absolutely. He's Bert Chantley. I'm Chris Phillips. We appreciate you guys tuning in and we'll catch you next time episode of the Spurs Up Show.